All right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Dr. Andrew Gardner, and I'm the project director of the Making Baptist History Public History Project, an initiative of the Baptist History and Heritage Society. And I'm joined this evening with the Society's Executive Director, the Reverend Dr. John Finley. And we are excited this evening to be coming uh, to you virtually from Moorhead, Kentucky, uh, for our penultimate uh, webinar in this uh, public webinar lecture series. Uh, tonight, uh, tonight's webinar will feature a discussion of the recently published work, A Mere Kentucky of a Place, the Elkhorn Association and the Commonwealth's First Baptists. And tonight we're going to feature a lecture from Dr. Keith Harper, uh, who is the recently retired uh, senior professor. Next year. Next year. Okay, next year. Uh, so who is the senior professor of Baptist studies at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. Uh, additionally, we'll hear a pastoral response and reflection from someone who is very familiar to folks from First Baptist Church Moorhead, the Reverend Aaron Coyle Carr, um, who will offer uh, a response uh, following the lecture. Uh, and at the conclusion of tonight's uh, uh, event, we'll have roughly 20 questions, uh, 20 minutes for question and answer period. So if you have any questions that come up uh, during the course of the lecture or uh, Aaron's response, please keep them ready for the Q&A. Lastly, before I turn it over to Keith, I want to thank and acknowledge that this project is generously funded by the American Historical Association in collaboration with the National Endowment for the Humanities. Any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this webinar do not necessarily re represent those of the American Historical Association, the National Endowment for the Humanities, or even the Baptist History and Heritage Society for that matter. But we do hope that these webinars uh, will promote uh, the study of history in local congregations and local uh, communities more widely, as well as encourage historical thinking uh, within our local communities. So with that, please remember to keep yourself muted throughout tonight's program until we get to the question and answer period. Uh, and I will turn it over to Keith. Hmm. And thank you, Andrew. And uh, thank you everyone else who tuned in this evening and welcome to tonight's presentation. The title of my book is uh, A Mere Kentucky of a Place, the Elkhorn Association and the Commonwealth's First Baptists. Uh, I found that quote and uh, cards on the table. I live for unusual things in primary sources. And when I came across this quote, I just thought it was an absolutely amazing thing because Samuel Meredith, was writing to John Breckenridge on March 2nd, 1791. And he says, as our friend Lewis Craig is fond of saying, Kentucky is a mere heaven, or heaven is a mere Kentucky of a place. And I thought, that's, that's golden right there. I think that's fascinating. But I don't want to get ahead of myself. Let's start where we should start, and that's the beginning. Historians live for why here, why now, and so what? kinds of questions. Why did this happen? Why did it happen at this point in time? And what is it about this that makes it significant? So if I'm looking at the Elkhorn Association, and once again, if I just want to lay everything out in the open, I want to work you through some of the things that I found fascinating about the people who made this story and why I think they're important. And I became fascinated by the Elkhorn Association through John Taylor. He was one of the early Baptist preachers in Kentucky, and he wrote a tract called Thoughts on Missions. You can read about it in chapter six of A Mere Kentucky of a Place. But it was in 1812 when Taylor entertained two congregational missionaries who were working the area in a religious survey capacity. One man was John Shermerhorn, and the other was Samuel Mills. And they met up with John Taylor as he was living up in Gallatin County at the time, up near Cincinnati, actually. He had left the Elkhorn area. And um, by the way, if you're unfamiliar with Kentucky, the Elkhorn area is the area around Lexington, Fayette County, up into Frankfort, around in there. So uh, he was up near uh, Gallatin, and Mills and Shermerhorn dropped in on him, and they began to tell him the benefits of missions. They said, if you would become a missionary and you would become an advocate for missions, the attendance in your church would double, 
they would pay you a fabulous salary. And that took Taylor aback for two reasons. Number one, he was already independently wealthy. He had probably 10 to 12 enslaved persons there under his charge. He was a what we would consider a small planter, actually. And not only that, he thought getting paid for preaching was outrageous. He had been in a church in Virginia for 10 years before he came to Kentucky, never made any money until one day the church surprised him with a $100 love gift out of the blue. They didn't uh, tell him they were going to do it. They surprised him with it, and he was greatly gratified by it. But preachers don't preach for money. They don't do that kind of thing. And in listening to these missionaries, he remarked that he thought they were zealous, probably pretty nice guys. But it was then that he did strongly smell the New England rat. That got me. Now, I grew up on the banks of the Ohio River. I know what rats are. But what is a New England rat? What makes them special? More important, forgive me for putting it this way, what do they smell like? So if you get a whiff of a New England rat, what is it that you're smelling? Now remember, historians live for why here, why now? And I was absolutely hooked by these fellows. Well, that and my wife is from Lexington, and I did graduate from the University of Kentucky. Anyway, that aside, I'll try my best to abbreviate a long story here and simply say that once I saw the New England rat, and once I began thinking about the Elkhorn Association, and about John Taylor in particular, I kept coming back to this particular association, because every time I did, there was something about them that became increasingly captivating. Um, they were pulling me into their orbit, if you will, and I just couldn't help it. Okay, I really didn't do a lot to fight it. But the thing about it was, what was it that drove these guys? So over the years, Elkhorn became a rainy day project. And this went on from the late 90s until about 2013, when my wife said, you know, you really should do something with those guys. You've been working with them long enough now that you really ought to, to tie that story together. And she was right. But digging led to more digging. And so along the way, I found out many things about these fellows that really shaped or reshaped, I should say, my understanding of uh, late 18th, early 19th century Baptist life. So let's have a question. Why did the early Elkhorn Baptists like John Taylor and the Craig brothers leave Virginia to begin with? The early Elkhorn Baptists came to Kentucky from Virginia. Why? Why did they leave Virginia and come to Kentucky? Now, this is where history morphs from something interesting into something really interesting, even fascinating, because that's the story that doesn't really get told. Now, if you begin to dig deeply into a historical issue, or a person, a place, a thing. Uh, historians will tell you that you need to familiarize yourself with the secondary literature. Now, if you're unfamiliar with secondary literature, it's just the material that has been written about your subject already. What have others said about your people, your place, your thing? And whenever I read the secondary literature, I found numerous books on Virginia Baptists. I found books on Kentucky Baptists, and most of them took note of persecution. It's like uh, Lewis Peyton Little's now famous Persecuted Baptist Preachers of Virginia. And sure enough, whenever I looked through the pages of Lewis Peyton Little, what I found was a number of these early Elkhorn Baptists, men like Elijah Craig, men like Lewis Craig and others, had been either jailed for preaching or threatened for preaching uh, or for any other number of issues, but they wound up in Lewis Peyton Little's work. But I thought there had to be more to the story than that. Did they leave Virginia simply to escape persecution? And sure enough, there was more to the story than that. 
there was a lot more. So from here, I began reading other accounts, not of Kentucky Baptist, but of Kentucky. And Kentucky has a fascinating history in itself. And one thing I discovered right up front was the Craigs were among the Commonwealth's largest land speculators. So you go from persecuted preacher to land baron or wannabe land baron. And if you look in the early land claim books of Kentucky, you'll find that at one point the Craigs um, either individually or in joint partnership claimed nearly a quarter of a million acres. Yeah, um, that sort of changes your view on the persecution narrative. You know, like, were these guys persecuted? Well, they did well for themselves in Kentucky. Or let me rephrase that. They might have done well for themselves had they been better surveyors. But as it turned out, they were bad surveyors. And having a land claim in early Kentucky was one thing, and keeping your land was something else. Now, if you get it in your head that you want to go back and study land in early Kentucky, um, good luck. Um, <laughs> I'll remember you, and I'll try my best to pray for you because you're going to need it. Land in early Kentucky was a nightmare because of land shingling, what they called shingling, one claim overlapping another, overlapping another, overlapping another, and it happened all the time, largely because of, number one, bad surveys, and also because of claim jumping happened all over the place, especially in the bluegrass region of Kentucky, where the most fertile land is, where the most tillable land on what for large-scale agriculture is. Uh, it was quite the problem. And so the Craigs, uh, were not the best surveyors in the world, and ultimately they made a lot of enemies. It was so bad that Lewis Craig, one of the most respected and revered ministers in, um, in the Elkhorn Association, by the mid-1790s uh, had left the region and had gone up to um, the area around about Maysville and uh, had relocated out. Uh, and hopefully, uh, and I believe he got out of the land speculation business. It was a real problem. So you have these fellows who are coming to Kentucky to make money. And um, that was something that I found uh, really fascinating because um, you go from persecution to making uh, a fortune and um, it kind of changes your perspective on, on who these guys are. So they made enemies with others. And not content simply to make enemies with others, they made enemies with each other as well. Um, when it came to church matters, I discovered very quickly that all was not well. Uh, these men <clears throat> who had fought side by side with others to secure religious liberty now had no trouble fighting each other. They were, for example, as Baptists come into the Commonwealth, new associations begin to form. Now, the Elkhorn Association is the first, and you have the Salem Association, with whom they got along well, but you also have the South Kentucky Association, which was formed south of the Kentucky River. They did not want to recognize the South Kentucky Association as religious um, cohort. They did not recognize them as brothers they did not recognize them to be in fellowship with them. And I had to figure out why, <clears throat> except I couldn't. And that was a problem, okay? Uh, they'd known each other back home. Back home, that is back in Virginia, they'd actually gotten along with one another. So what made Kentucky different? Once again, why here, why now? Now, that in part stemmed from the difference between regular Baptists and separate Baptists. Now, I don't want to take up the rest of the night trying to unpack the baggage there, uh, but there were slight differences that bore on worship style. Stop me if this sounds familiar. Worship practice, uh, how they conducted themselves along the way, and very minor doctrinal issues. 
And once again, I thought, that can't be all that's going on. And sure enough, it wasn't. What I found was that nearly to a man, everyone in the Elkhorn Association had actually fought in the American Revolution. Um, before he became a Unitarian, um, there were, well, there were several men who left the Baptist ranks and became Unitarians. But we had people in the Elkhorn Association, or I found people in the Elkhorn Association that had been officers in the Continental Army. Um, we had a colonel, a militia colonel. We had, uh, depending on who you read after, some people say that he was a captain. Other people say that he was a major, but he was an officer in the Army. And then there were others like John Gano, who were actually chaplains in the Revolutionary Army. And so Elkhorn, very pro-revolution, very Jeffersonian, if you will, very much like Thomas Jefferson, and um, not so much in South Kentucky. Even the women, the wives of Elkhorn preachers are frequently cited in the records of the Daughters of the American Revolution, because they did things like bring water to troops in forts. They did things like feed troops who were on the front lines and so forth, and they were recognized for being staunch supporters of the revolution. But going back to the difference between separates and regulars, many separate Baptists <clears throat> were reluctant, pardon me, to support the American Revolution uh, just because they did not want to get involved in the politics. They were all about religious freedom. Don't get me wrong there. But when it came to getting involved in the politics of it all, they thought, mm, maybe we shouldn't do that. A lot of reasons for that, I suppose. But one thing about it, Elkhorn did not want to recognize South Kentucky. And it was, it was almost 20 years before they would recognize them on an equal footing. So I found that very, very interesting. So to that, I would say, here's a sidebar for you to consider. Maybe we'll talk about this more in the Q&A session later on. But when somebody tells you it's always about theology, it's very seldom all about theology. And there are contributing factors to the reasons why there are schisms and why there are problems and why you can't get along. And that's what I'm finding as far as Elkhorn is concerned as I'm digging deeper and deeper and deeper. Something else I've found that I thought was fascinating. I discovered that there existed a pecking order of ministers. Now, the common wisdom is that these were frontier Democrats, and they called each other brother, and they recognized one another as equals. But I'm here to tell you that is an exaggeration. Now, true, but it's exaggerated. Some ministers like John Gano, for example, the one I was telling you about a minute ago, let me tell you a little bit more about John Gano. Before he came to Kentucky, he was pastor of First Baptist Church of New York City. When the revolution was over, he was horribly in debt and um, did not really know how he was going to get out of debt until he met up with a man named William Wood. And Wood said, do you know, I'm from Kentucky. I'll tell you what, we could use a guy like you in Kentucky. You see this in, in the literature from the, area, from, from the era all the time. You could be useful in your ministry. Useful ministry, key words. And Gano thought about it. And um, so he sold what he had. He paid off his debts. And he went to Kentucky. And he served a church uh, in what would become Lexington. It was out of town a little bit. It was called Town Fork Church. And he served there um, for years until he passed away in the early 1800s. If John Gano spoke, everybody else listened. And they would come closer to listening to him than they would somebody like Elijah Craig, who has gone down in my un unofficial history of the Elkhorn Association as the biggest troublemaker who ever was in the Elkhorn Association. That guy was a problem. Um, I try to say that spiritually, mind you, but he was. He was a problem. Just take my word for it, please. Or better yet, buy the book and read it. 
They make excellent gifts, I say. Anyway, so there is a pecking order. Here's how I figured that out. If you look at the records for the association, who is chosen to be the moderator more often? Who is chosen to be the recording secretary? Who is it that is frequently asked to deliver the associational message? There's a lot of preaching when the associations get together for their meetings. Sometimes they'll last three or four days. It was quite an event. And you have to figure if you're traveling from 30, 40, 50 miles away, you can't turn around and then just go home the same day. What you got to do is camp out, stay, and uh, fellowship for a while. And they did. So who preached the messages? Who moderated the meetings? Who took the notes? Who was responsible for maintaining structure and order? And um, who did they regard in the highest respect? And that doesn't necessarily mean that these guys are egalitarian among themselves. They weren't. Um, and I found that to be very interesting. Um, it's interesting in its own right, of course, but it's also interesting because it helps run contrary to what we tend to think we know about these individuals already. But I think the most sobering thing that I found in studying the Elkhorn Association, I found that slavery was vitally, vitally important in defining Elkhorn's identity. And who are these people? And what did it mean? If they are Jeffersonian, what did it mean that all men are created equal? So they did not believe that African-Americans were created equally. They just didn't do it. And they turned their backs on ministers like David Barrow. David Barrow, um, you don't hear a lot about David Barrow. He didn't draw a lot of attention to himself, but consider this. In that pecking order I was telling you about a minute ago, and the respect that is afforded to other ministers, how did, how did you gain that respect? What, what was it that would cause you to go up in respect or down in respect? And there were several things. Number one, what kind of preacher were you? Were you a good preacher? And good is a relative term. And that's where you have to read some of the comments by these early preachers to find out who they thought were good ministers. Um, and trust me, they were very free in their opinions of who was a good minister and who was not, who was a good preacher and who was not. John Taylor, if you ever read any of his work, and he wrote quite a bit beyond Thoughts on Missions, he also wrote A History of Ten Baptist Churches, of which the author has alternately been either the pastor or a member thereof. I love that book because you read the title, you basically don't have to read the book. But it's still very interesting whenever you do, because he'll talk about preachers and one who will remain nameless. Uh, he described as one of those high toned Calvinist brothers who was rather like uh, a candle. He was better at snuffing it out than he was in lighting it. Ow. John. Anyway, I just find stuff like that fascinating. You know, you read up on these guys and. There they are, Betty. They're, they're letting everybody know about it. So what kind of preacher are you? How is your church? To all appearances, is your church healthy? How much education do you have? They valued education. Barrow had a good education, even had an academy that he ran. John Gano had a great education, and he ran a, um, like what we would call a, a minister's institute. If you wanted to come and spend time with him, study with him and everything, he mentored other ministers. So it's a very hands-on type of approach to uh, ministry. But your preaching ability, relative uh, health of your church, um, your level of education, how you carried yourself, did you pay your bills, did you have a good testimony in the community, all of these things lent themselves to the amount of respect that you would have among the ministers. And it was a sliding scale because you could go up in their estimation or you could go down in their estimation. It all depended. Well, David Barrow is a Revolutionary War veteran. He's well-educated. And oh, by the way, 
he had been persecuted for the faith. Uh, he was nearly drowned back in Virginia for preaching. And here's a man who should have sat at the top of the, of the very pyramid for highly regarded ministers. But David Barrow had freed his slaves in 1784, and he thought other people should do that as well. He's not an abolitionist. He's not going to be the kind of person who stands up and says, this is what you need to do. But if you ask him, he would tell you. And um, when he got to Kentucky, um, and that was a problem. And part of that problem stemmed from very early debates that the Elkhorn Association had on slavery. For example, if you read their minutes, what you're going to find out back in about 1790, 1791 or thereabouts, there was a query that came before the association. Now you might think, what in the world is a query? Well, it's a question. Somebody stands up and goes, uh, okay, so if we as an association are in business, I got a question I want to ask. Simple as that. Okay, brother, what is your question? Well, here's my question. If you have a slave who's married and you come to Kentucky, but their mate stays in Virginia, is that slave free to remarry in Kentucky? That was a good question. And they debated the question and they decided to sit on it for a year. And they sat on it for a year and it came up again the next year that they met and they could not come to a consensus on it. So they tabled it indefinitely. So there is this persistent push about what are we going to do about slavery. Now, remember, Kentucky becomes a state officially in 1791. So this early debate is part of what is part of a larger debate on the state level of what kind of state are we going to be? Kentucky is admitted to the Union as the 14th state. Are you going to be slave? Are you going to be free? Everybody's looking. So Kentucky is debating this. They're going to have their not first, not second, not ninth, but their 10th constitutional convention. So if you study Kentucky history, it took 10 conventions to get together before you have a workable constitution. So the issue of slave marriages comes up even before Kentucky is a state as does a resolution. The Elkhorn Association meets before the 1791 convention and they pass a resolution that Kentucky should be a free state. A couple of months later, they have a subsequent called associational meeting and they say, that resolution was unwise and we think we will reconsider that. And so they pulled it and they did not push for it. And when that convention met, 40% um, of the delegates there for that state convention, con constitutional convention, didn't want slavery. They voted against it. And the majority of them were ministers. So how does that work? Well, Kentucky comes into the union as a slave state. However, there's a proviso in Kentucky history that says after that constitution, and we have, we Kentuckians have waited a reasonable amount of time, we will revisit the constitution and we will make subsequent changes to it as we think they're needed. Um, you might've heard something similar expressed this way. Let's get the plane in the air and we'll work on it then. How many of y'all have ever heard that? Oh yeah, I promise you. That's exactly how Kentucky came into the union. Let's get the plane up and we'll work on it. Well, 10 years later, it was time to work on it. It's 1800, 1801, around in there. Uh, David Barrow has moved to the state and there is still this agitation for what are we going to do about slavery? Well, it wasn't even close in the second convention. You had people who flooded into the Commonwealth. They brought slaves with them they opened slave markets, they traded uh, slaves there, and slavery was there to stay. 
But what are you going to do if you have people who insist on bringing that up and making that an issue in your association? That's what happened in Elkhorn. It was an ongoing and troublesome issue, and they never could um, they they never could bring themselves to just admit slavery is wrong and to do away with it, because here's the story, and uh, here's the most controversial thing I found out: these guys were not running away from religious persecution. There was that I admit that told you that up front, but these early men were looking to make money. They came from Virginia. They moved into Kentucky. They saw an opportunity to become wealthy. They saw an opportunity to become powerful, and they seized on that opportunity. Um, and that's all there was to it. So guys like David Barrow, guys like Carter Tarrant were not really welcome in the association anymore. Um, they took the unprecedented. There were a number of ministers who took the unprecedented uh, steps of actually going to David Barrow's church on the day they were having services um, and um, trying to get him voted out of his own congregation uh, against Baptist polity, against anything that Baptists say that they believe. Um, well, it didn't work that day, you know, and uh, but but that's the lengths to which they were willing to uh, go. And David Barrow wrote a, a, a pamphlet, well, more like a booklet, actually. It's just a, a size thing uh, called Perpetual Unmerited, uh, Unwarranted Slavery, declared to be um, unscriptural, immoral, non-Republican. He had the whole thing mapped out. And then point by point, he tried to show anybody who would listen that slavery was wrong. Now, I challenge anybody, if you want to defend slavery as an institution, read that booklet and see if you can still do it. And to his credit, to his eternal credit, David Barrow paid for the publication of that book out of his own funds. He paid for it. He gave it away free and it fell on deaf ears. There are other stories about religious, uh, well, religious squabbles there in the Elkhorn Association, uh, squabbling for one reason or another. They could not get along with one another, and uh, those problems persisted well into uh, the 19th century. One schism after another, one group leaving after another. As a matter of fact, by the end of 1809-1810, there was a local, uh, hmm, I got to be careful here because this, this is a very long and complicated story. But as it turned out, the minister who succeeded John Gano at Town Fork bought a, um, a slave from one of his members. Uh, who just happened to be one of the wealthiest men in Kentucky. And uh, that, uh, that, that servant passed away, and uh, the preacher did not want to pay, and uh, the man demanded payment and split the church, split the association. And guess what? Whenever he, he wanted to bring, they brought charges against the preacher. I deal with this, I think it's in chapter four. They bring charges at the association level, like it's a court or something. And the association says, uh, you know, we, we, we just don't see how you can bring charges against your preacher here. This, this is just absolutely ridiculous. And that split the association. I found that whenever I was looking at the schism at the associational level, um, I believe it fell along generational lines. So you have these fellows who, some of whom had gone on to their eternal uh, reward, if you want to put it that way, and others who, uh, you know, were clinging on, but uh, you had a younger group of folks who came by and they were not, uh, uh, they were not uh, tied to old ways and they went their own way. And the association then is in real trouble until missions brings them together 
and missionary work becomes a new consensus point. But even then, consensus was very difficult to come by because I believe the die was cast. Now, going back to John Taylor, who I was telling you about before, Taylor hated missions. He hated the thought of it. it smelled like a New England rat, remember? That's what he said. But his, he was an old revivalist, and he wanted to see people profess faith in Christ. He wanted to see people come to church. And even though he never really embraced missions, he could not deny its results. And at the end of his life, there he was, not necessarily alone, but he was rather isolated. Ambivalent is probably the best way to describe it. He had seen a lot of changes. Some of them were good. Some of them were not good. And he just didn't know how to deal with that kind of change. So that's the why here, why now. What about the so what? Why are these guys important? Well, we could talk about that a long time. However, here's a couple of thoughts for you. We're different now. We have technology. We have mass communication. We have travel networks. But how different are we really? Fundamentally, how different are we really when we can't get along over issues that should unite us rather than divide us? Things that seem simple and straightforward tend to be things that get blown into uh, huge proportions. They're blown out of proportion, and ultimately, um, they bring schism. So we're not so different after all. They may have been 200 years ago, but they read like something that would uh, fit conveniently today. And I found that very, very interesting. And I will turn it over to Aaron now. And uh, I'm eager to hear his comments. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Harper. And thank you, Dr. Gardner, for the invitation uh, to offer some words of response. Um, essentially, we're going to be building off of that, that question of how different are we really. Um, but before before I get to that, let me say that when, when Andrew first asked me to do this, I have to confess that I was a little nervous, uh, and I was nervous on two fronts. The first one, and I will plead ignorance due to my own Methodist education, is that I simply did, don't know a lot about Kentucky Baptists or their history. Um, I was familiar with the Reverend Elijah Craig, but not from the pages of a history book. <laughs> Uh, and in addition to not, you know, having this as a part of my education, I am, I am a Baptist pastor in Kentucky, but I am among the juniorest of the Baptist pastors in Kentucky. I have lived in the Commonwealth for just shy of two years, and so my first thought was, surely there are more experienced Kentucky Baptists who can handle this. Um, the second reason that I was nervous is that my church uh, does not exist within the, the sort of uh, sphere of the original Elkhorn Association. You know, Elkhorn's limits uh, in, in Montgomery County kind of butt up uh, against the Gateway region and Appalachia, where, where uh, Moorhead is. Um, but, you know, we came along almost 100 years later. Uh, we do kind of connect to this story uh, with, with the mission movement and some very kind of um, do-gooder folks from the church in Mount Sterling coming to uh, Bloody Rowan, as it was called in the 1880s, and desiring to kind of spread civilization and religion and all of those things. So we are connected to this story, but we aren't kind of an integral part of it. But exactly as Dr. Harper has just kind of mentioned, the more that I read through this book, the more that I realized that while these stories are, you know, kind of uniquely Kentuckian, and they're full of these really interesting and colorful characters, everything that the, you know, all of the themes that these stories raise reverberate into the present in some really powerful ways. And most of our churches, associations, denominational bodies, or other kind of Baptist adjacent um, organizations are still grappling with a lot of the things that these Elkhorn Baptists were grappling with. So, for example, uh, one of the many things that got the Reverend Elijah Craig into trouble 
uh, was his arguments with other Baptist ministers about the appropriate uh, approach to pastoral ministry. Uh, Craig believed that um, the idea of a settled uh, pastorate was inappropriate um, and that Baptist pastors should be self-supporting, uh, maybe even a little bit itinerant, um, which is a really easy thing to say when you are a land baron or a wannabe land baron. Um, but these are conversations that are beginning to reemerge, right? As theological education changes, as the economic situation changes, as we grapple with the great resignation, in air quotes, uh, and, and the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, what does pastoral ministry look like? Are we headed towards a bivocational future as so many people um, predict or speculate? Is, is the gig economy kind of taking over the way that we approach pastoral education? Um, was, was Craig right? Um, which then kind of uh, raises some questions about the, the social roles of ministers and the kind of social hierarchies that we all know exist amongst ministers, um, because the reality is that, you know, there will always be a kind of subset of clergy who have the resources to be well-educated. And so if we do transition into a future where bivocational ministry is the norm, are we then going to wind up effectively creating a two-tiered system of clergy where, you know, those who have the resources to afford uh, a fancy theological education are the ones who get the biggest churches and have the largest, the loudest voices, while everybody else just kind of scrabbles to get by. Um, but also, how do we sort of, sort of grapple with the fact that theological education is changing, social attitudes towards ministry are changing? You know, it used to be not quite in the period that we're talking about in this book, but it used to be that a solid theological education was a first class ticket to the middle class, to, to the upper echelons of the middle class. You know, you got a degree from a well-respected school and all of a sudden you were, you know, running for public office or sort of holding public trust in your community. Um, as theological education becomes more and more niche, are we going to see, um, that that social stratification kind of increase even further. Um, but then also, um, there's this interesting kind of trend that I have noticed, having benefited from it myself, uh, of theological education sort of devolving to churches, a kind of away from seminaries, which is something, you know, that occurred in this, this Elkhorn period, where um, it was the responsibility of an individual congregation to kind of identify those within their ranks that they believed to be fit for the work of ministry and train them and prepare them. And so, you know, we see pastoral residencies emerging as places to kind of, if nothing else, fill in the gaps from a formal theological education and prepare people for um, roles in, in pastoral ministry. Um, are we going to, well... <laughs> I won't get in, into that. I won't, won't get myself in trouble this early in my remarks. <laughs> um, some of the other themes that really resonated with me in, in this book, um, Dr. Harper kind of mentioned the role that a minister's uh, political affiliation and their sort of political imagination plays in the way that they approach ministry and the ways in which those political sort of um, bonds perhaps explain or at least offer extra nuance to uh, conversations and conflicts that emerge both within and among churches. Um, and I don't know if if you all know this, but um, your pastors all have political beliefs and uh, opinions and assumptions. And as I kind of was listening to you talk, Dr. Harper, I was wondering if our sort of American, modern American inability to talk about politics in public has prevented us from acknowledging some of the things that you've talked about, that, you know, the, the conflict between the Jeffersonian Republicans and the Tory isn't quite the right word, but it's the only one that I can think of right now. Uh, the folks in the South Kentucky, or the other folks in, in Elkhorn and South Kentucky, you know, not being able to talk about that difference kind of obscures it. And if we can't be honest about these differences, how can we begin to acknowledge them and you know, find ways, find ways forward. Uh, another big theme in the book, and you heard Dr. Harper kind of touch on this a little bit, is 
the this sort of ongoing conflict about the limits of associational authority and what what do associations exist to do and what questions can they adjudicate and can't they you know the the elkhorn association had no problem saying that they were empowered to deal with the question of slavery and represent the entire association um but then with questions like you know elijah craig and his many many conflicts they felt like they didn't have that authority and um I'm going to assume that everybody on this call is familiar enough with recent Baptist history uh, that I don't have to kind of rehash some of the more recent conflicts around what can associations or denominations do or not do. Uh, this literally was a theme in the news this week. Um, can, well, again, I'm not going to get myself into too much trouble at this point. Um, you also heard Dr. Harper talk about missions. And again, those of you who are familiar with um, the modern, and I, by modern, I don't just mean early modern, but I mean like in the last couple of, of generations, um, you know the ways in which uh, John Taylor's fears about missions were seemed to be pretty well founded. Um, that once missions became the kind of um, be all end all of Baptist cooperation, then it became really easy to justify a lot of things in the name of missions or to paper over a lot of things in the name of missions. Well, we can't do that because it will it will affect the missionaries or we can cooperate <laughs> because um, we we support mission, but that's the only thing that we have in common. And when that becomes hard, how do we choose to continue to cooperate? But then the theme that that really just absolutely struck me the most, and, and Dr. Harper, I think you, you brought it up in, in some really beautiful and tactful and nuanced ways is the tension that emerges between a sort of faithful adherence to you know small o orthodox christianity and the the sort of acquisitiveness the desire for material prosperity that emerges among these these early baptist leaders and it 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 touches on a, a lot of different things you know was uh, was David Barrow and and the folks who kind of aligned themselves with Barrow's position were they um, did they make the right choice in sort of living completely by their principles or would it have been better for them to moderate their viewpoints a little bit and help lead their congregations towards more kind of lasting change I think as a minister this is one of the questions that I face all the time right is how far out ahead of my congregation can I be when it comes to issues of public witness and, and ethics kind of in the public sphere? What is the relationship between um, congregational change? What, you know, the relationship between effectiveness and faithfulness? Uh, and if I worry about that too much, do I suddenly find myself sinking into the mire of uh, the white moderate that King, you know, famously addresses in the letter from the Birmingham jail? Um, and it really kind of got me thinking about what are the sort of cherished economic institutions that I participate in on a daily basis that my grandchildren are going to look at and go, oh my gosh, how could they have possibly believed that that was okay? How could they have passed a resolution endorsing this? How could they have ever said that this was compatible with living Christianity in public in, in any century? Um, and that's a question that keeps me up at night sometimes, I have to confess. It's not as obvious to me, at least, as, as something like chattel slavery. But, um, you know, what are what are the things about our relate, you know, our relationship to money and economy and acquisitiveness that that have the potential, you know, in the in the kind of long term to hamper our, our Christian witness? And so I think, you know, this question of how different are we really, really is, is the question. I mean, these themes echo and reverberate, and obviously they, they gain kind of new um, themes or, or new levels of nuance in the 21st century, but I think we're still kind of grappling with all of this. And I find that both kind of sad that in 200 years, we haven't really gotten past a lot of these questions, but I also find it kind of encouraging um, because it, it sort of suggests to me that these are perhaps not questions that ever can be resolved, um, that in much the same way that every generation has a responsibility to kind of grapple with scripture and wrestle with it and find new meaning, it's almost as if every new generation of Baptists has a responsibility to grapple with these questions. 
Um, and while we may not come to the same conclusions that our, our historical siblings in Elkhorn did, we can at least benefit from um, paying attention to their own grapplings uh, and add them to our conversation as, as we continue to grapple with these questions in the present. So uh, again, thank you, Dr. Harper, for this book. Um, it was, it's been a long time since I've read academic history, and I have to confess that I found it very approachable, um, and I really appreciated it. And as a relatively new Kentuckian, it gave me a new appreciation for, for this place that I call home, uh, and for the quirky stories of um, the people that with which I identify both culturally and religiously. So um, thank you very much. Great. Yeah, thank you, Aaron. That was fantastic. Um, really helpful. Keith, would you like to respond to that before we go into Q&A or go straight into Q&A? Uh, no, thank you, Aaron. Uh, I found your, your comments very helpful. Um, I would say go ahead and don't worry about getting into trouble. I'm not. <laughs> uh, just jump on into the deep water there. And um, so many things that, yes, I believe that and I, we're in the same boat, really. Um, it does concern me that after 200 years, we still act in a very similar kind of way. Um, I didn't do it whenever I was researching the book, but now, since you brought that up, I wonder what Elijah Craig would have looked like if he had a Twitter or a TikTok account. <laughs> um, <laughs> James Garrett on Snapchat, just picture that. Um, just <laughs> anyway, you, you got to laugh sometimes. It, 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 it keep you from crying. But yeah, the way that the economy is tied together, um, I find that I just find it very interesting. And I believe that we're now living in the uh, on the other side of the eclipse of a Protestant hegemony, if you will, or mm -hmm. a, a Protestant position. And I believe that's really where the culture wars stem from. You know, you're you, before, uh, well, let's say, uh, oh, well, after the Constitution, as a matter of fact, uh, you have the separation of church and state, but you have a dominant strain of thought that stays that way until well into the 20th century. But when it comes down to equal rights, when it comes down to the civil rights movement, when it comes down to nuclear proliferation, when it comes down to Vietnam, when it comes down to urban decay and the fact that your cities are falling apart and religion, which should have a unified voice, has a divided voice, um, you know that there's big problems and it just cashes out, cashes out, cashes out. And I believe, uh, I believe Andrew had broached the subject earlier, uh, and I know Aaron did about, is this harming our witness? Yes, it is. It, uh, why should the world take us seriously when we can't even get along with one another? And that, uh, Aaron, that keeps me up at night sometimes, mm -hmm. truly. So yeah, I appreciate your comments. And as a, a new Kentuckian, I bid you welcome. I grew up in Southern Indiana, but I got to Kentucky as quick as I could. Um, <laughs> I did live with one foot in the Ohio River. I'll go ahead and admit that. I grew up in a place called Jeffersonville, which is right across the river from Louisville. Yeah. And um, so uh, it's a fascinating state. Yeah. It's different. And um, every Kentuckian's proud of it. Great. Thank you so much. I will uh, enter into the chat. If you'd like to uh, get a copy of the book, you can use the discount code HARPER20. And you can get 20% off from the University of Tennessee. So don't buy from Amazon. Um, uh, buy from buy from the, the, uh, the press. Um, don't allow your economic choices to impact your public witness. Never. Exactly. <laughs> um, so uh, I'd like to open it up for Q&A. Does anyone have any questions for either Aaron or Keith? No need to be shy. Dr. Harper, um, I'm looking forward to buying this book. Um, and uh, I am not a historian. I'm a law professor uh, interested in Baptist history and heritage in this organization. Thank you so much for what you've done tonight. It's incredible. I'm so glad it's recorded. Um, I vow not to be that African-American Baptist who comes in with a question about slavery and race, but you did such a fascinating job opening it up. 
I, and it may be in the book. I'm going to order that book. I'm so glad you put the code in because I was, I was actually ordering on Amazon looking for it right now. So you saved me. I'll go that way. But if you could just comment, and it may be in the book, um, in early Kentucky Baptist history with the Elkhorn Association, which I think is centered around Lexington, mostly yes. like sort of Southeast Fayette County, not really downtown. If you can comment on any interrelations, I, I seem to recall that the, an early pastor of First Baptist of Lexington was an abolitionist. He helped a local Black Baptist congregation secure its pastor's freedom by providing basically a loan to them, things like that. The, the first African Baptist church came into the Elkhorn Association, I think around 1820, and then uh, became very vital there. You, you know, and just the, if the role, the, given the complexity of the position for abolition by the Elkhorn Baptists, then pulling back for a more moderate approach, anything you have to comment on how they interrelated with the Black Baptists who were there, some of whom were not under their authority, which was highly unusual, as you know, in the South at that time. Um, so just anything you have to say on the actual interactions of Black Baptist church folk in early Kentucky with these Elkhorn Baptists in what had one of the largest concentrations of Black people in the entire state, the Lexington area, please. Oh, yes, indeed. Uh, let's see, Andrew, how much more time do we have? <laughs> We've got plenty of time. <clears throat> Dangerous words. Okay, uh, the interaction with the African American community. It's a it's a great question, and it is a mixed answer. And it in case in some cases it came down to a church by church sort of situation. Now the Bryan Station Baptist Church, which is out of Lexington away. Um, that was pastored uh, by one of the Revolutionary War veterans. Uh, Ambrose Dudley was the pastor of Bryan Station Baptist Church. And if you read their church records, um, there was a there was an African American who was preaching, you know, uh, two other African Americans, and they really didn't like it. They said, nah, you're out of order. You don't need to be doing that. And um, I don't say a whole lot about that in the book. Um, could it would be a different? I mean, it would be a book of its own, obviously, because there's an awful lot to say. But uh, and there were other there were other African Americans who were preaching, and they didn't have a problem with that. So, what was the difference? They weren't really clear, and that's the frustrating thing about trying to study church minutes. Uh, you've got to read between the lines, and sometimes the lines are so tight together, you, you really can't decipher what's going on. If you ever read church minutes and you see spirited discussion, it means somebody threw a punch and, and <laughs> there was a fight that broke out. Um, and, you know, if they had cops locally, they would have called the cops. Um, but you don't really get that in, in their minutes. And so that's kind of different. And then in other cases, it's just like, the there were African Americans who were brought before the bar of church justice for drinking, swearing, uh, fooling around, the, the kinds of things that you would expect. And it it's really hard to determine what they're what they're thinking. But and I, I don't cover this in the book because I really didn't see it until about a year ago. Um, if you go to Lexington, there's a bookstore called Glover's Bookery. Is anybody familiar with it? Oh, man. It's an old house that is crammed full of books. I don't know how many books John has, but he's got a lot of them. And uh, I was in Glover's one day, and he had a map of Lexington from the 1870s. And I thought, well, that's kind of a neat map. It was framed, and so brought it home sitting in my office at Southeastern one day, and I was looking at the roads that went out from downtown Lexington, and they looked like spokes on a wheel. And I went out every one of those major roads, and I thought there was a, there was a significant Baptist church there. And by significant, they always sent people to the associational meetings uh, sometimes they would send more than just a couple of people. Sometimes they would send five, six people to the associational meetings, and they went out into the rural area 
around Lexington. And I thought, well, that is fascinating. Now, <clears throat> the history of First Baptist Church Lexington is a bit of a minister, uh, a bit of a mystery, because there are some who believe that what was left of Town Fork Church long after John Gano had died, sort of migrated on into town and really became the nucleus of First Baptist Church. There's something to be said about that. And then later on, of course, you know, they, they established their own identity. But right about the time that would have happened, there's also a shift, and I'm, I'm going to land the plane here in just a second. Hang on with me. There's also a shift from the rural concentration of wealth, if you will, in these large churches that were out there, had multiple slaves uh, involved with the families there, and, that, and there was a shift in wealth into downtown Lexington. If you're interested at all, uh, let's see, Amos, if you're interested, take a look at a book uh, by Richard Wade, on the development of urban Lexington, and he deals with Lexington and that economic growth roughly from 1820 forward. Now, I don't cover that in the book, but take a look at Wade because there begins to be a concentration of wealth and a concentration of power. Now, those churches out in the rural areas were still strong. They were still influential churches, but you have a shift into the urban context and over time, that power, that concentration of money, uh, that, um, um, well, all the things that make the city the dynamic place that it is, just expand as Lexington grows. And then Lexington churches still network with one another in that association. But I believe if you can get into the records sufficiently, what you'll find out is there's a lot more uh, commerce between Lexington and Frankfurt, and ultimately Lexington and Louisville as well, because that's where the money is. That's where the power is. That's where that dynamic goes on. And since you brought the issue up, I am increasingly fascinated with a place like Louisville, Kentucky, and the wealth that is concentrated as the city grows, but then as the suburbs grow and the wealth expands from it, what happens to thing like, things like social services, which had largely been taken care of through the agencies of the churches and those downtown churches, as they move out into the suburbs, uh, folks are either left on their own or they're left for government benevolence. And there's got to be a religious commentary there. Uh, it plays into so many things that we are, especially after 1945. And we come back to that whole interconnectedness between who we are as a political people and as a religious people as well. Now, going back to First Lexington, in that place where First Baptist Church of Lexington is, and the African American church is literally right across the street from it, and they're both within eyesight of Rupp Arena in downtown Lexington, it's an amazing thing because of the dynamic that went on there. A segregated dynamic, to be sure, but uh, they were allies with one another. How it all worked, um, I think that's a, that would be a great book. Um, and, and I would love to see somebody dig into that. But yes, they were there uh, and they worked well with one another because frankly, I'll just go ahead and say it, they both needed each other. And um, uh, it, it's a great story. And I wish I could have done more with it. You've encouraged me more than you know. I will email you later. Thank you, Doc. <laughs> yeah. Thank oh, you. listen, absolutely. Tell me, uh, you're a law professor. Whereabouts? I used to be at Campbell oh. Law School just down US 1 from you for six years, and now I adjunct here in Washington. I'm a native of Lexington. Um, oh, but I okay. In Washington, I practiced here for 17 years, and uh, I, I'm an adjunct professor of First Amendment law at Trinity Washington University in their media program. I used to be a journalist. Um, ah. I was a lawyer, so I do some First Amendment stuff, not the church stuff, which I'd rather do. I'd rather do ecclesiastical abstention and free exercise, but I'm doing media law. So thanks for asking. I had great students. I had Joel Heinbach, Dr. Heinbach's son, as a student at uh, Campbell, and he, he became a friend. So uh, if, you, if you're if you friendly with Dr. Heinbach, he may remember me. I met him at, around the time of his son's wedding. So uh, it's wow. a good, good times in that part of North Carolina for six, seven years.
I had great, this is, great this, this is unbelievable. One of these days, I'll tell you about spending Thanksgiving with the Heimbox and playing football with him. <laughs> I understand he's a great shot. The man, he can shoot like, <laughs> that's what I, he has a perfect, uh, whatever they call it. Uh, but yeah, we didn't talk about that when I met him, but I've, I've read some things. <laughs> mm. Very yeah. interesting. Yeah, Dan, listen, Dan is like the Energizer Bunny. He, he's keeping, he's still beating the drum and he's still going. But uh, in all seriousness, uh, email me anything you want. I'm, I'm happy to be a dialogue partner with you on that. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Other questions? That's great. Other questions people have? For either Keith or Aaron? I'll say I'm a little curious about uh, the politics uh, here with the revolutionary and the the, the Tory. I'm curious how that uh, how that changes over time. Um, uh, how once um, once you get into the early republic, do Baptists start to have more of a consensus around kind of you know political? Uh, kind of uh, uh, opinions in, in you know, once, once you get past, uh, you know, the election of, of, of Jefferson in 1800 and moving, moving further into kind of the death of the Federalists, um, do, you, do you tend to see more of a, a consensus among, among Baptists in Kentucky, or is there still that divide? Uh, that's really hard to nail down, actually. Uh, there if you think of consensus in an umbrella concept or as an umbrella and with areas of sub uh, consensuses, consensi, whatever the plural of consensus is, somebody help me, uh, but whatever those are, you have multiple consensuses beneath that one umbrella. Now, at the risk of sounding like a reductionist, I believe there's a good bit of that umbrella that is tied to economics and land. And mm -hmm. as long as you are looking at land and economics, you're back to uh, the question that Amos brought up a minute ago about the relation of slavery. And if there's a galvanizing point, there's, you know, um, it's going to be around your economic freedom. And that, of course, on a larger scale is going to imply, um, <clears throat> pardon me, it's going to imply slavery. And that's why the mission movement comes along. And after the mission movement begins to take hold, Baptists are divided one way or another over whether or not they're in the mission movement. And for those who are pro-missionary, Andrew, what you find is they can, uh, quote unquote, agree to disagree. You know, good men disagree on this point, but we agree on these points over here. So it gave people another place to go so that they could either hide from or just ignore some of the other issues that were really more pressing. Mm -hmm. So let's say somebody comes back and in a political way, like the abolitionists did, begin to press the point that slavery is immoral. Then you have this structure built where, I say it's a structure, it's an informal thing, but you know how it works. You have the um, the head of the plantation, the father over the family. And then when it gets down to the enslaved population, well, they are over them too, as children. The whole thing about a benevolent type of paternalism, you know, that arises and everything. And that helps you hold things together on a political issue when there's a moral issue that comes along and says, well, no, wait, you, you really can't do that. And then the counter argument is, well, number one, it's in the Bible. Number two, uh, we're good masters. We take care of our people. We tend to them like we do our own children, et cetera, et cetera. And you wind up talking past one another and legitimizing it. Um, when Aaron was making his comments a minute ago, I wrote down a word, theologizing. And you take an issue and you talk around it by sanctifying it with theological rhetoric rather than cutting down to the heart of the matter. It's like, okay, is this issue right or wrong? 
well, and then you, you deflect and you begin to discuss things on a theological level and you get lost in the words. And I think that happened right up until the Civil War. I think it continued happening after the Civil War. I think we're doing it today. Mm. That's helpful. Thank you. I really do. Now, um, yeah, politics. I'm think I, I think I'm going to plead. I was going to hush. <laughs> That's fair. Uh, uh, and any other questions we have for either Keith or Aaron? If not, I won't make us sit here in silence for the the remainder of our time. I will direct you all in the chat again to the uh, 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 one to to the discount code to get a copy of uh, uh, Dr. Harper's book. Uh, the second is a link to the Facebook page for the Baptist History and Heritage Society. Please like and follow. Uh, we have one other additional webinar coming up uh, on uh, tribal politics in India. Uh, and Naga Baptists, uh, that'll be mm. on April 18th. Um, and so follow, like and follow, and, and you can get a link for that. We also have 10 other uh, webinars that we've done that are all on YouTube. Uh, you can find those through the Facebook page as well. Um, I see a question uh, in the link of how the Elkhorn Association minutes were preserved. Um, uh, and Amos is saying that they're digitized uh, in the uh, Southern Seminary or Southern Baptist Theological Library. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, so yeah, if you'd like to go look at the, uh, I, I think they're digitized. They're definitely a Southern Baptist library. Um, and I think I found them online. That's how I knew about these black people going to the Elkhorn Baptist convention from about 1820 to 1829. And then they, their own church was recognized, which is the first African Baptist church of Lexington. There was another there. They had a split. It's contentious. We'll talk about that, Dr. Harper, but yeah, that's where I learned it. So I, I do know that those minutes are at Southern Baptist. Okay. Great. Thanks, Amos. Um, yep. If there is uh, nothing else, I will thank you all for joining us. Let's give a round of Zoom applause for both Aaron and, uh, and uh, Keith and thank them. Uh, and I wish you all a very good evening. Uh, and hopefully you can join us for the next webinar. All right. Have Thanks for having me. Thank you for this, Andrew. Sure.